He is alive. You afraid? Right from birth, I was scorned within, adorned with sin, but I'm glad I'm born again. My relationship with God used to be worn and thin, but I'm sworn to him their son what a storm had been. Inform you can about his amazing grace. With my poetic praise, I try to raise the place. Fire shut up in my bones at a blazing pace, and we are not of this world like rays in space. They made the case for Christ and delivered the verdict. He bled, hung, and died. Everyone in town heard it, hours of pain, but they were not hours in vain. Because of his sacrifice, his mercy is hours to gain. He was resurrected, he rose on the third day. My heavenly home's erected, that's just what the words say. In the worst way, his message he could use. I'm alive in Christ and I'm telling the good news. Anybody else not afraid to tell the good news? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not afraid to ruffle a few feathers. And I'm going to say a few things that are controversial. Now before I wrap things up with a rap, tonight I wanted to start things with a rap. And I also want to start by showing a quick hip-hop video. And I hope I don't get into too much trouble for this. You know, in hip-hop videos, they often shake their tails. Can I say tails? They shake their tails. In this short clip, there may be a little tail shaking. It might be a little controversial. Let me see if I can play a quick hip-hop video. Oh, yeah. Look at that hip-hop. Slow-mo hip-hop. And there's a little bit of tail shaking, as you can see. Hope you're enjoying this hip-hop video. Y'all know people love hip-hop, right? I mean, isn't this what the people want? Isn't this what this season is all about? Isn't that who people celebrate? Don't people want a hoppy Easter? For many, it's not about Easter Sunday. It's about the Easter bunny. For many, Easter is about eating sweets. But there's something about the name Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know. For many, Easter is about looking for bunny eggs, as funny as that sounds. But when the women went to the tomb, I don't think they found any funny bunny business. But they did find the linens with which the Lord was wrapped. After he died for our unrighteous rap sheet, with sheets he was wrapped. So I don't think the woman saw any hip-hop, just rap. And as been said, no bunny loves you like Jesus. I saw that on a t-shirt once, and I almost got it. But I wanted to be a little more controversial. So I got one that says, Silly Rabbit, Easter is for Jesus. Another one says, It's not about the bunny, it's about the lamb. No bunny loves you like Jesus. No bunny died for you like Jesus. And no bunny rose for you like Jesus. And when you pray, no bunny hears you like Jesus. Speaking of which, when you've taken a picture with someone, have you ever given them bunny ears? It's when you would pose for a picture and put two fingers behind someone's head as you said cheese. So it looked like they had bunny ears. Seems harmless, right? Remember back in the day when we had to go get pictures developed? They could take like a week, unless you had a Polaroid camera that would print the picture right after you took it, right? In any case, it would be kind of funny when you paid to have your pictures developed and waited a week, only to find out that someone had given you bunny ears. Someone's fingers had ruined the photo. Nowadays, people show different fingers that ruin photos, but let's not get too controversial. But bunny ears is just some funny bunny business, right? Seems harmless. Well, I recently read up on the origins of bunny ears, and it's a little more serious than I thought. You see, back in the Middle Ages, they were apparently known as cuckold's horns. And a cuckold is a man whose wife is unfaithful. As you know, with many animals, it's the males who have horns. And horns are often a symbol of strength and masculinity, even in Scripture. So a man who wasn't strong enough or man enough to keep his wife from cheating on him was thought to, in a sense, lack horns. And because men with cheating wives metaphorically lacked horns, when they would take pictures, people would give them replacement horns or bunny ears. They would give them replacement horns or bunny ears. It was a cruel joke. So giving someone bunny ears may seem like harmless fun, just some funny bunny business. But it was really a sign of infidelity, unfaithfulness. Now, as we discussed many times in Bible study, in Scripture, 
The Lord's people are often pictured as his wife. The Lord is the husband of his people. See Isaiah 54, 5, Jeremiah 31, 32, etc. And in Ephesians 5, the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. Yet in more ways than one, this wicked world has given the most important day in Christianity bunny ears. And many who claim to celebrate Easter are not faithful to the Lord. What about us? Will we be faithful? For better or worse? For richer or poorer? In sickness and in health? Till death brings us even closer to Christ? Or will we be afraid? He's alive. You afraid? Now, have you ever watched a movie or show that ended on a cliffhanger? You know, the suspense just builds and builds and then it just ends abruptly with no apparent resolution. If you've ever seen the end of The Sopranos, The Thing, or Inception, you know that they all have endings that keep audiences talking. Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back also leaves a lot of storylines unresolved until the next film, The Return of the Jedi. That said, much of the popularity of modern cliffhangers is said to stem from the show Dallas. You see, in the spring of 1980, after the season three finale, CBS had millions of Americans wondering who shot JR. But fans had to wait until the next season to find out who done it. Now that's before my time. For those of you who, like me, weren't around during 1980, it's hard to convey just how much hype there was concerning who shot JR. J.R. Ewing was on the cover of magazines. They put him on beer cans. Vegas was taking bets on the identity of the shooter. It was crazy. Believe it or not, the actor who played J.R. Ewing, that is Larry Hagman, said that he moved to England to try to avoid all the hype. But even in the UK, everywhere he went, people would stop him and ask, who shot J.R.? He said when he would walk across the street, public transportation buses would pull over and people, including the bus driver, would try to talk to him and get his autograph. And believe it or not, he went to the Queen Mother's 80th birthday party, and she was like, I don't suppose you can tell me who shot JR. That's my impression of his impression of her. And he was like, no, ma'am, not even you. Now, there was an actor strike that delayed the start of the fall TV season in 1980. But in November, after months of media frenzy, speculation, and betting, the shooter was finally revealed. During that episode, reportedly between 83 and 90 million people tuned in. It was watched by almost 76% of all television viewers in the entire country. At the time, it became the highest rated TV episode in American history. And 40 years later, it still sits at number two. Now, the studio was worried about leaks, so they spent an entire day filming multiple takes of multiple characters shooting JR. But do you recall who shot JR? It was Kristen. Kristen was JR's former mistress. Kristen shot JR. Now, my wife's name is also Kristen, spelled the same way, actually, K R I S T I N. And I'm Danny Scott Jr. Kristen, please don't shoot JR. Physicians are supposed to help save a life, not take a life. And how many know that for our sins on Good Friday, the great physician, paid his life, and gave us life. But that's not how the story ends. My point is, when a story ends abruptly, it keeps people talking. Cliffhangers can grab people's attention. And many have used cliffhangers to do just that. More recently, in 2018, Marvel's Avengers Infinity War ended abruptly with the heroes in some serious trouble. Fans had to wait an entire year until Avengers Endgame resolved the conflict. And that whole year, fans just couldn't stop talking about it. At the box office, Endgame grossed a whopping $2.8 billion, at the time becoming the highest grossing film in history. You see, cliffhangers grab people's attention. Abrupt endings keep people talking. And I contend that the abrupt ending, the cliffhanger at the end of the Gospel of Mark, is geared to grab our attention and keep us talking. But talking about what? 
you know, we can talk about a lot of things, but there's one topic that is more important than anything else. One day that is more important than any other day. One name that is above any other name. Jesus. Jesus has risen. After dying on the cross on Good Friday, Christ was alive on Resurrection Sunday. He's alive. You afraid? Are we afraid to tell the good news? Afraid to study the good news? Afraid to live the good news? Are we afraid to tell the world that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was raised on the third day for our justification? Are we afraid to tell the world that God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one-of-a-kind son as an atoning sacrifice for sin, that all who are faithful to him shall not perish, but have eternal life? See John 3.16. We certainly aren't afraid to run our mouths about everything else. Why shouldn't we run our mouths for Jesus? Why not talk about our holy God after Holy Week? Why not talk about our resurrected Savior after Resurrection Sunday? Why not share a link, write an email, send a text, post a video, make a phone call, start a conversation, share a scripture, invite someone to service or Bible study? Why not spread the good news? Unless, of course, we're afraid. Now, though Mark has a controversial conclusion, an abrupt ending, Jesus has already told his disciples exactly what was going to happen. As we see in Mark 8.31, it says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Mark 8.31 also, Mark 9, 30 to 31 says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. And finally, Mark 10, 32 to 34, it says, They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Mark 10, 32-34 so to anyone reading Mark, the death and resurrection of the Savior should be no surprise. There is no twist ending. Yes, it's abrupt, but it is not unexpected. Recall that the books of the Bible, like most books that are written, are meant to be read from start to finish. In Scripture, many times we just jump around from place to place without paying attention to the whole arc of a book, from the beginning to the ending. Well, this is one of those dramas where they tell you the ending ahead of time. So let's fast forward to the Good Friday, when Jesus is crucified. Starting at Mark 1540, it says, Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Mark 15, 40 to 41. Now, Roman soldiers may have given women more leeway when mourning someone who was being executed. And in this context, Christ's female followers would have been safe from incrimination. That said, as we said in a previous Bible study, with the exception of the disciple Jesus loved, who was likely John, who likely wrote the Gospel of John and was his cousin, all his boys beat it. As he predicted in John 16, 32, the Redeemer's road dogs hit the road. His sidekicks scattered. The disciples of the Deliverer have dispersed and even denied. Most of the future leaders of the people of the Lord got lost. But the ladies stay near the cross. I don't mean to be too controversial, but for the most part, the men are absent. The women are present. That said, right before chapter 16, Mark 15, 42 to 47 says, It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate 
and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Verse 46, so Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of a rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Mark 15, 46 to 47. Now, as you may recall, the Sabbath technically starts on Friday at sundown. And on the Sabbath, you could not do any work. You could not even travel or walk long distances. So Christ had to be buried before Friday at sundown, before the Sabbath. Otherwise, those who were working on his body will be breaking the Sabbath. In Mark 16, 1, it says, Then when the Sabbath had passed, Mary the Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Mark 16, 1. Now the Sabbath ends at sundown on Saturday, likely around 6 p.m. Thus, the women likely bought these spices sometime on Saturday evening, since shops would not be open during the Sabbath. And as we've seen, this trio of women was already mentioned in Mark 1540 at the crucifixion. Now, Jews use spices or perfumes or oils with pleasant aromas to anoint dead bodies. Not every body would get these spices, but they were often used on the bodies of very important people. These were not necessarily spices you'd find in the kitchen cupboard. They were not trying to add flavor to the body of the Savior. Rather, anointing dead bodies helped reduce the stench of decomposition in the hot Mediterranean climate. After anointing, the bodies would be rinsed with water before they were buried. But the women couldn't buy the spices for the anointing since, once again, Jesus died on Good Friday, just a few hours before the Sabbath started at sundown. Now notice that at the end of chapter 15, Joseph of Arimathea already had Jesus' body prepared for burial. Also, John 19, 39 to 40 says, He, that is Joseph of Arimathea, was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. John 19, 39 to 40. So spices had already been put on the body of the Savior by Joseph and Nick at night. But perhaps the woman thought that what they did wasn't enough for King Jesus. Some say certain spices were only used for the bodies of kings. And their spices were likely different than that of Nicodemus. For theirs was likely an ointment consisting of olive oil and fragrant spices. Whatever the case, anointing Christ's body was an act of devotion. This was a sign of respect. That said, the fact that they were bringing spices to anoint his dead body suggests that they were not expecting a resurrection. Even though, as we've seen, Jesus had predicted his death and resurrection in three days on several occasions. Perhaps they doubted the words of the Lord, just like many doubt the words of the Lord today. Regardless, Jesus saying that he would be resurrected in three days seems questionable since he was only buried for likely less than 36 hours. Yet Jews counted any part of a day as an entire day. Thus Jesus was crucified and buried late on Friday, day one, was in the tomb all day and night, Saturday, day two, and was raised from the dead on Sunday, day three. Three days. Continuing in Mark 16, to 3 it says, And very early, on the first day after the Sabbath, when the sun had risen, they come to the tomb, and they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone outside the entrance of the tomb for us? Mark 16, 2-3. Now the first day after the Sabbath was the first day of the week. Since the sun had just risen, this is early Sunday morning. Back then, people usually got up at dawn at the first light. Before dawn, there wouldn't be enough light to navigate to the tomb. And because it likely had to be cut short because of the Sabbath, the women now go to the tomb to complete the anointing procedures. Now, tombs like this had a disc-shaped stone that was rolled into a groove in the ground right in front of the tomb's entrance. As you can see behind me, these stones would be four to five feet wide, one foot thick, and hundreds of pounds in weight. Suffice it to say, these ladies were going to need some help. 
And they knew how big the stone was because, as we've seen earlier in Mark 15, 47, both Marys were there when Christ was laid in the tomb. So for whatever reason, it seems that they are not prepared for their tasks concerning Christ's death. And they are definitely not prepared to hear about Christ's resurrection. Continuing in Mark 16, 45, it says, And when they looked up, they observed that the stone, which was extremely large, had been rolled away. And when they went into the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Mark 16, 45. Now, tombs would only be opened if another member of one's family died, or for a secondary burial. That's when the bones of the deceased would be buried a year later. So to see that the stone was rolled away so soon would be puzzling, even if there wasn't a young man inside. And the term young man refers to a man under the age of 40. However, given the circumstances and given what we read in the other gospel accounts, the young man dressed in a white robe is most likely an angel, not just an ordinary young man. In scripture, you'll see that heavenly beings are often dressed in white robes, and angels who are sometimes called princes tend to look like people. In any case, as you'll see in Matthew 28 too, Matthew explicitly mentions that there is an angel. It was an angel who rolled the stone away. But even though the stone was rolled away, this doesn't mean that the women could actually see inside. With tombs back then, one would actually have to stoop to get through the entrance. They may have even had to crawl inside. But once you got inside the tomb, you could stand and see everything. When they saw the stone had been rolled away, they may have just thought that someone else had the same idea as them. Perhaps Joseph of Arimathea and others also wanted to finish the burial procedures and were already inside. But when they see the angel inside, that must have been quite a shock. No wonder they're alarmed. Continuing in Mark 16, 6 to 7, it says, But he says to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, the one who has been crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Mark 16, 6 to 7. Now, as we often see in Scripture, once an angel appears, they have to tell people not to be afraid. Sudden angelic appearances are alarming. You know, we often ask God to encamp his angels all around us for protection. But imagine if we actually started to see angels encamping all around us. I bet we will be a little alarmed as well. That being said, the angel tells the woman not to be afraid and that Jesus has been raised. And the place where they laid him likely refers to a shelf or a bench upon which Christ's body had laid inside the tomb, like the shelf behind me. Christ's physical body is gone, and the angel tells them that Christ will meet his disciples in Galilee physically. And notice how among all the disciples, Peter is singled out by Jesus. Now, this does not mean that Peter is no longer considered a disciple. He is included in the group, but he is highlighted in the statement. Now, after Jesus was arrested, do you recall what Peter did? Even though he swore he would never do it, he denies Christ. As Christ predicted, Peter denies him three times before the cock crows. And here, many think Peter is emphasized in light of Peter's emphatic threefold denial. In Mark 14, 27 to 31, Jesus tells his disciples, You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. That's Zechariah 13, 7. Verse 28, But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Mark 14, 27 to 31. Despite his admirable words, we know that Peter, the leader of the disciples, does in fact deny Jesus three times before the cock crows. See Mark 14, 66 to 72. And when Jesus is arrested in Mark 14, 50, it says, then everyone deserted him and fled. 
Then everyone deserted him and fled. Mark 14, 50. As we see in Mark 14, 28, Jesus has already told the disciples that he will go ahead and meet them in Galilee. There was no twist ending. And even though Peter disowns him three times, Jesus graciously calls Peter, the leader, to follow him as a disciple once more. Now, at the time the Gospel of Mark was written, perhaps around AD 60 in Rome, Mark's Christian audience may have been enduring persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. In AD 64, the great persecution of Christians under Emperor Nero began, and Nero burned many believers alive on poles. Many say they're on fire for Jesus, but many of our past brothers and sisters have literally been on fire for Jesus. As we've said, to follow Christ, metaphorically and even literally, you got to be ride or die. And at this time in the 60s AD, both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome. They were both killed for the faith. And it stands to reason that many of Mark's first readers may have disowned Christ to avoid such suffering. So perhaps this message for Peter the denier will be encouraging for other Christians who had also denied Christ. Perhaps they would come back to Christ as well. Thus, this seemingly insignificant sentence is full of hope, forgiveness, and restoration. Dear friends, have you disowned Christ? Do you know anyone who once followed Christ but now denies him by their words or their works? Have you fallen away from the faith? Why not come back to Jesus today? Why not make today a turning point in your life? Recall that in Revelation 3.20, when Jesus says he stands at the door and knocks, he's addressing the people of the lukewarm Laodicean church. Beloved, come back to Jesus. He came back to life for you. He died for us. Let's live for him. Then in Mark 16.8, it says, And they went out and fled from the tomb, because trembling and astonishment seized them. And they told nothing to no one because they were afraid. Mark 16, 8. So in response to the good news, we see that the women are shook. They are scared speechless. And nowadays, too many of us are shook and scared speechless when it comes to spreading the good news. Now, some say that the women didn't say anything to anyone while on the way to tell the disciples. But Mark doesn't say that. That said, we do know from the other gospel accounts that the women did, in fact, tell Peter and the disciples that Jesus had risen, eventually. In Matthew, for instance, after the angel appears to them, it says in Matthew 28 to 10, So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Matthew 28, 8-10. And eventually the disciples get the message. They meet Jesus in Galilee, where he gives them the Great Commission. See Matthew 28, 16-20. In Luke 24, 9-12, it says, When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Luke 24, 9-12. In John 20, you'll see that Mary Magdalene sees the empty tomb, and runs to tell Peter and the other disciple, who is unnamed, but is likely John. Then those two disciples have a foot race to the empty tomb. So all in all, we know that these women did tell the good news to the disciples eventually. Now, if you ask four different people to film a biographical movie about the same person, there's going to be some differences. You won't get four carbon copies of the same film. Different filmmakers may want to highlight different themes and different people, but the core details should be the same. Likewise, the different gospel authors highlight different themes and different people, but the core details are the same. 
Jesus was raised from the dead, just as Jesus said. And the women were the first eyewitnesses. And this is kind of incredible. You see, back then, women could not even be witnesses in a court of law. But on Resurrection Sunday, they are the first witnesses of Christ the Lord. Now, I have a few scars on my lower back. And I could say that after I saw someone snatch an old lady's purse, I heroically ran them down and tackled them on some gravel. And that was how I got my scars. But would you believe me? What if I told you that I was playing basketball at the church picnic in the parking lot, and one of the deacons blocked my shot so hard that he made me fall on my lower back? And that's how I got my scars. Which story is more believable? The more embarrassing account is more credible because when people lie, they usually lie to make themselves look good. And this is good evidence that the gospel authors are not writing fiction. If you were making up a fairy tale in this context, you would not have women be your first witnesses. And if you were trying to sugarcoat the story, you also would likely omit the part where Peter denies Christ three times and everyone deserts him. When historians see embarrassing details like these, they know this is evidence the account is true. For when people lie, they usually lie to make things seem better than they really are. In any case, in the case of Christ, the women are the first witnesses, and they are told to go tell his disciples to meet him in Galilee. In all four Gospels, the core details are the same. However, in Mark, the story ends right here, abruptly. Mark 16.8 is most likely the last original verse of Mark's Gospel. As most modern translations and study Bibles will tell you, what is called Mark 16.9-20 does not appear in the earliest manuscripts that we have of Mark. Moreover, the Greek vocabulary and style are quite different from the rest of Mark. And as a matter of fact, there are several alternate endings of Mark that can be found in ancient manuscripts. Thus, for these reasons and more that I won't bore you with, as scholars point out, these verses were likely early editions that were not in the original text. It may be that a second century scribe used material from the other Gospels or other oral traditions to kind of smooth out Mark's abrupt ending. So it seems that because the ending is so abrupt and kind of troubling, later people apparently tried to tie up Mark's loose ends. It's a controversial conclusion. But the original text likely ends right here at verse 8. So the question is, why does this gospel end with Mark 16.8? Many have said that the gospel of Mark is not complete. Some say the ending was never written or that Mark was martyred before he could finish. Some say the real ending was somehow suppressed. Some say the ending was lost. In any case, Jesus has predicted his death and resurrection at least four times in Mark. And as we've seen in Mark 14.28, He's already said that he would meet his disciples in Galilee. So once again, there is no twist ending. Even though it doesn't mention the resurrection appearances, the Gospel of Mark is not incomplete. And Mark may have felt no need to write about the resurrection appearances that his readers already knew about. It stands to reason that Mark intentionally ends the Gospel with this verse, with a suspenseful cliffhanger to provoke a particular reaction from his readers. You see, back then, many authors ended their accounts before narrating events that they had already predicted or foreshadowed. For example, in the Iliad, which is likely the most popular book in all of ancient Greek literature, there's no mention of the fall of Troy and the Trojan War, nor the death of Achilles. And the infamous Trojan horse is actually only mentioned in the sequel, The Odyssey. But these important events are foreshadowed in the Iliad. Back then, ending writings and dramas abruptly was often done for literary and rhetorical effect. It's a controversial conclusion. It's a cliffhanger. And even today, as you've seen with Dallas and the Avengers, cliffhangers grab our attention. Abrupt endings keep people talking. Now, as you'll see throughout Mark, people run their mouth about Jesus when they aren't supposed to. But here, at this point in time, Ironically, the women are actually supposed to go and run their mouths about Jesus, but they don't, because they're afraid. By ending the story right here, I think the point Mark is making is this. 
at this point in our time, are we going to run our mouths about Jesus, or are we afraid? The angel tells the women the good news, the gospel, and they are supposed to tell others. Likewise, we have been told the good news, the gospel, and we are supposed to tell others. Recall that Mark not only has an abrupt ending, but an abrupt beginning. Mark 1.1 1, 1 simply says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah, Son of God. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. And then it jumps right into how John the Baptist fulfills prophecy as the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. See Mark 1, 2 to 4. And by the time readers get to chapter 16, we've heard this good news, the gospel. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in Mark 14, 24, at the Last Supper, after drinking from the cup, Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who paid the price for our sins, establishing a new covenant, the New Testament, in his blood. And he has been raised. He is risen. We have heard the good news. We have heard the gospel. What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do with this information? Metaphorically, the angel passes the baton to the women. And Mark passes the baton to his readers, to us. You see, just hearing the good news of the resurrection is not enough. Just like reading the good news of the resurrection is not enough. Like the women, we have a decision to make. In a way, we're in the same position as them. We don't see any resurrection appearances in Mark. And only a few hundred people have ever seen the resurrected Lord. See 1 Corinthians 15, 5-8. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed and yet are faithful. The abrupt ending forces us to think, will we respond in faith? Jesus is our leader who has gone ahead of us. Will we follow him? Will we proclaim his gospel? Will we take the baton and run this race? Will we pass the baton to others? Or are we scared, speechless? It's a controversial conclusion. But cliffhangers grab people's attention. Abrupt endings keep people talking. And I contend that the abrupt cliffhanger at the end of Mark is geared to grab our attention and keep us talking. He's alive. You afraid? We're not afraid to run and tell the bad news we see on the boob tube. Are we afraid to run and tell the good news we see in the Bible? We're not afraid to talk about the gossip. Are we afraid to talk about the gospel? We're not afraid to announce the victory of our favorite athletes and organizations. Are we afraid to announce the victory of the Alpha and the Omega? We're not afraid to talk about Hollywood. Are we afraid to talk about the Holy Word? We're not afraid to talk about singers and rappers. Are we afraid to talk about our Savior who's resurrected? And at the empty tomb, we don't read about hip-hop. Just rap. The Lord, whose body was wrapped with sheets, paid the penalty for our rap sheets. Are we going to be faithful followers? Don't let the unfaithful put bunny ears on this holiday. I don't have any Easter eggs to offer, but I do want to egg you on to excel in your explanation and exclamation of the gospel. For our Lord is excellent. No bunny hears you like Jesus. No bunny cares for you like Christ. No bunny died and rose for you like the Redeemer. And if with the righteous Redeemer we've gone off-road, if we've strayed from the course of Christ, now is the time to get back on track. Together, let's run this Christian race. Metaphorically, the angel passes the baton to the woman, and Mark passes the baton to us. Who's ready to run? Let's run like a nose when the people got a cold. Let's pass the baton like it's just too hot to hold. On fire for the Lord, don't just stop, drop, and roll. The angel rolled the rock away. It's time for us to rock and roll.